And so let's get to our special guest, um, Jack Howell. So Jack, I'm just gonna put you on spotlight so everyone um, can see you. Hey Jack, welcome. How you doing? Good. I'm uh, proud to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And are you enjoying the cactus in the background? Love it. That's perfect. I expected nothing. That, you're just in your backyard, right? <laughs> Tucson, Tucson is my home. Um, last few years, we moved to Kansas in a rental home because my grandkids are there. So we wanted to spend time with them. But when the COVID hit, we moved back out here to Tucson. So and then just a little tidbit of information. Years ago, when I played for the Angels, I was given the nickname Cactus Jack because I'm from Tucson. So cactus is my mantra, I guess. There you go. You just took my my first question. I was going to ask you about that, but uh, they, I guess it was just I'm kind sorry. of obvious. I'll just shut up and let you do the show. <laughs> no bad. worries. No worries. So well, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm appreciate just going to give a, a quick intro for everyone um, for who doesn't know your story. I'm just going to run down a quick bio here, and then we'll we'll get into the questions. Um, so Jack was born and raised in Tucson, as as you mentioned. Uh, it was, it was Arizona through and through. He went to Pima, CC, and the U of A, University of Arizona. Um, despite not being drafted uh, in the 83 draft, uh, the Angels signed him and he quickly shot through the system and made his big league debut in early in the 85 season. So really quickly shot up there quick, and established himself as a reliable and versatile player. Um, from 87 to 89, he averaged 20 home runs a season. Um, and then in 91, the Angels traded him to the Padres, uh, played with Padres for a little bit, and then went on to Japan, which uh, um, is where he really shined and is the reason why he's here today. So um, he played for the Swallows from 92 to 94. In 92, he, was the, he won the MVP of the league, his first Gaijin to win in his first season. He led the league in homers and, and batting average. Um, and led the team to the Japan series where they lost to the Lions in, in the seventh game. Um, and then in 93, uh, they made it back to the series. Um, they beat the Lions in seven games. Um, and during that year, he ended the series. He, he was uh, really established himself as one of the all-time clutch players, hitting five sayonara home runs, which is a record that he still has. He hit for the cycle that year. Uh, I think it's safe to say that the uh, Swallows fans – forever will love him for those couple seasons. Um, he uh, played one more season with the Swallows before going on to the Yamiuri Giants in 95. Um, and then he turned to the major leagues for the, with the Angels for a couple years, the Astros for a couple years. Um, and in total, it was 17 years, I believe, of playing pro ball. Does that sound right? <laughs> um, you're saying that I'm old. I think that's what you're leading to, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. But, uh, you know, throughout the 17 years, he was really just a reliable guy that could play all over the field. Um, you played every position in the field as a pro except for pitcher and catcher. And I'm, I'm sure you would have done those if they let you, right? Well, pitching because I was afraid of how fast it was going to come back at me and catching because I didn't want to squat down. So I left those two tough positions out. Fair enough. I don't blame you for that. Um, and then uh, since retiring as a player um, in 99, he's been coaching in, the, in uh, professional baseball. He's the big league hitting coach with the Diamondbacks. Uh, he's been with the Angels for, for quite some time. Um, is, if this season wasn't all messed up, he would have been the manager of the Burlington Bees uh, for the third season. So um, that's the story up to today, uh, if you all didn't know it. So, uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us, Jack. No, thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, giving everyone that insight into my career. And it's going back to the Japan thing. I think it's one thing, a good insight to have is, isn't it amazing that although the honors are amazing, and I, I really appreciate the MVP season. Um, but truly, my MVP season was that 93 season. It's amazing how just because you don't get the MVP honor, uh, it truly was the season, um, some big clutch hits. And then ultimately, helping uh, the team win a world uh, Japan series. So um, those were memorable times. And I, I appreciate being on, being on this call um, brings back a lot of memories and man, I really miss Japan a lot. I've been able to go back twice since I've been retired, but haven't been back in a while. So I really miss those times and excited about this podcast. 
Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of us are excited to talk to you. Uh, I don't think you'll get a group of American fans who are more knowledgeable and into Japanese baseball. So you're, uh, we're in the right place here. Um, so I want to, I want to start with, uh, in 92, when you, uh, went to Japan initially, what was, how did the offer come up and what was the decision-making process to, to jump over to Japan? Well, it's funny. I, um, uh working with uh, minor league players now and stuff, we always talk about what is their why, you know, why are they here? Obviously to get to the big league and, you know, occasionally guys will talk about money. Let's face it though. You got a chance to make a lot of money, but I always try to say that your why should be that, you know, to be successful and be a big league player and, and, and achieve something that you've probably wanted since you were a kid. But going back to your question, um, it's amazing that I tell this story and I, and I laugh, but it is kind of true that, you mentioned I was traded to the Padres and towards the end of the season, we're playing uh, the Dodgers and Dodger stadium. And I get a call from a guy that says, uh, Hey man, I know this is your, you know, you've been traded. It's your uh, free agent season. Uh, have you ever thought about playing in Japan? And I said, no, I didn't even know they played baseball in Japan. I was pretty <laughs> illiterate when it came to that. And um, he said, well, would you be interested? And I said, man, I, you know, it's my free agent year. I'd like to sign a nice deal with somebody. And, and continue on here and he said well what if I could get you a million dollars and I said uh, where do I sign <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, no I mean I, I was clueless when it came to that but as we negotiated and I realized it was uh, you know going to kind of be a strike year and and the opportunity was there and as I learned more about it um, you know I signed and went there and and I definitely had no clue man I think we our first spring training was in Yuma Arizona which I'd gone down to Yuma in spring training to play against the Padres for years, but couldn't imagine that my first spring training with the Japan team would be in Yuma, Arizona, but showed up there and was just really had no clue to anything, man. But I think, you know, you kind of mentioned earlier, a non-drafted player that just found a way to make it. Um, I think the thing that really helped me, and I didn't have a lot of advice from people, but they said, man, just, um, you know, get to understand the culture, get to know the players, you know, in, engage yourself and engross yourself. And, and maybe I was that player that just always did what I was told. And I think it really helped me because, you know, we're out at six in the morning doing running and working out and I'm right along with them. I think a lot of them were shocked that I was out there, but I just immediately just kind of joined in and became part of the team. And, and through that, I think uh, maybe I got some credibility early on. Um, but it, it was a, it was a struggle early, man. I was away from home. My wife, I had a, a 10 year old and eight year old. And then my wife was pregnant with twins, um, at the time. So it was, it was tough to leave the country in those circumstances, but, um, started out the season really, really slow and really struggling and really questioning myself. Um, but I was really grateful for that opportunity and obviously things changed. And I don't know if you want me to continue on with the, with kind of how it happened, but. Well, yeah, I, I was, I, maybe you're alluding to this, but um, I know from uh, Rob Fitz's book, Rob's on the call actually right now in uh, oh. remembering Japanese awesome. baseball. Sure. Um, which that was the first way I learned about you, except for actually, I think I had a couple of your baseball cards, but other than that, I read the chapter in the book and uh, one, the cool part, probably my favorite part was you talking about when your son joined you for the second half of the season. And, and you said how that really, coincided with with your putting up the numbers that won you in the MVP so yeah if you could talk about that and, and I'm also curious like if your son still talks about that summer um, today yeah so um, you know where I was going with that was that um, you know I'm struggling it's the all-star break I'd had a really bad hamstring and really fought through playing through that and really was just struggling um, and it's the all-star break um, my wife is getting close to having those twins um, and I went to ownership and just said, look, if you would let me go home uh, for about a week, let me go home and hope that she has the kids. I said, that would be really important to me. And I said, and then I'll see some of my, my doctors that I'd grown up with in Tucson, and I think they can get me healthy, and, and I'll come back and have a good second half. And I think they were a little leery to that, but um, they let me do that. And I flew back to Tucson. Um, Kelly did not have the twins. She, she went into a false labor. Um, but during that time, I saw some doctors that did some injections on my leg and I was able to come back healthy, but at least I got to go home and support Kelly a little bit. And I think that was a big key. I think in the book, I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure they talk about it too. Another key there was Issei, my hitting coach. 
had me use a, a, a different bat uh, in the second half, which I know had a lot to do with it. But I think the mental as well as, um, you know, physically getting healthier and then maybe that adjustment with the bat, um, all that that you talked about winning that MVP and all those numbers I put up were all in the second half because I think at the first half I was 245 with maybe 10 home runs and like 30 RBIs. And that second half was tremendous. But um, yeah, it was just that that going home and getting healthy and getting mentally uh, in a better spot um, and some adjustments through my hitting coach really uh, turned that season around. Yeah, it's interesting talking about the family stuff because, you know, as fans, you never, you know, you see these guys in the field and you expect them to perform. And I think especially in, in – Japan, when you come over as the foreign player, there's even higher expectations. You, you just got to, and there's even more complications off the field too. So that's an interesting insight there. Yeah, definitely. I wanted to, um, you know, I think I was I was raised in a Christian home, and I was brought up that um, you know you you give back, and and so you know I was not taking um, that nice contract and the ability to go to Japan and continue my career, you know, lightly. Um, I was really embarrassed at my play in the first half and and really wanted to come back and have something to prove, but I knew I had to physically and mentally get better. So uh, I, my hat's off to the Swallows for giving me that opportunity to do that. And then, you know, I think that I, I rewarded them with uh, with a good second half season. Was the was the bat a Japanese bat or was it a lighter bat or what what was the um, change? And, and it's fun. It's funny because I'll, I'll I'll need to reread the book. I'm not real sure, but I'm pretty sure he had me go with a little bit lighter bat. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure we went with a little bit lighter bat, and um, um, I think that was that had a lot to do with it too. Um, that that was a great adjustment. And, and Issei was a great hitting coach, man. He. Uh, you know, he, he really cared about his guys. I think he really cared about us guys being players um, and, and understood the stress that we were under. And so he was always very complimentary um, and very encouraging in everything that he did. So he was, a, he was a big key to the success that I had with the Swallows, that's for sure. Cool, cool. I'm curious about in the 93 season, you said you felt that was truly the MVP season. Like, were you always – a clutch hitter throughout your career and, and did you change your approach? What kind of led to the have this five walk off home runs that year? No, I, w I would never have called myself uh, the previous eight seasons in the, in the major leagues as, as a clutch hitter. I was always somewhere between four and six and just kind of a supplemental player. You got to remember in those early years with the angels, I was playing with Rod Carew and Reggie Jackson and Bob Boone and Downing and, and, and the list goes on. So I was playing with some pretty elite, um, well, most of them Hall of Fame players. So uh, I was just a supplemental piece there. Um, and I think when I, like I said, when I went to Japan in the 92 second half season, um, and then, you know, we can kind of take a step back. And, uh, people probably know this, but in 92 in those playoffs, I was horrible for being an MVP. The Lions threw me nothing but fastballs and just came at me hard. And I think I still have the record for the most strikeouts in a Japan series. So there was a little embarrassment for leading that, uh, ending the season that way. And just, um, you know, I think all the things we talked about earlier just came to place in 93. Um, there was that wanting to come back and prove an MVP season. I was definitely healthy. We had had the twins. Um, my wife had even come out. They'd given us a beautiful home to live in with our family. So you couldn't ask for a better situation. They set me up perfectly for that. So, you know, kind of that body, mind, and spirit. I was in a really good place. Um, and then, of course, back in – you know, deep inside your heart is about, you know, I want to get back to the series and, and kind of prove things wrong. So I think that was kind of my overall goal. But I think on the, like on the Sayonara home runs and things like that too, is, is that, you know, it, it's kind of, I call, talk, talk about like the compound effect or the snowball effect, you know, you have one and then you have two and you start to build confidence and it, it kind of just spiraled from there. And, and like I said, was just the numbers weren't as weren't as big, but uh, definitely the word you used was clutch. I definitely uh, really picked us up in the clutch, and I think that got us over the hump and got us back into the playoffs. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. All right, we have a couple of questions, so I'm gonna go to Ian first. He's gonna give you a competition for best background here. <laughs> there we go, <laughs> Ian. So um. <laughs> I was just wondering why you decided to leave Japan after being so successful. Um, yeah, so um, my goal, I wanted to play 10 years in the big league, so I wanted to get back. Um, I was starting to get a little bit older, 
Um, I think my um, heroics, for lack, lack, lack of a better word, were, um, were dying off a little bit. I went over to the Giants. But the real big key for that was, is you know, again, I know I sound like anytime there's a family problem, I bail. But um, I'd had a sick daughter. Um, and then some family issues that were going on, and I, I felt it was important to come back. And a lot of people don't, they think I kind of left Japan. I, I really had, had left Japan, but retired from, was retired from baseball. I mean, I was, that was going to be it. But then I just, when I got back home, things kind of cleaned up a little bit with, with my life. And, and, and then, you know, I, like I said, I had, I just had always had that goal to, to get 10 years in. Um, and it was the angels that called me back. So probably had it been, you know, oh, well, luckily I was luck lucky that, you know, a team did call me after being in Japan. That's not always so easy to come back from Japan after you're my age and get a job, but it was the angels that had asked me if I wanted to come back. And it wasn't like they handed me a guaranteed contract. They gave me a chance to come to spring training and try out. So once I was given that offer, I said, you know what, I, I don't think I'm ready to retire. But the, the short answer to your question was, um, I just think I was, uh, my talents were dwindling. I was considering retirement and I just didn't think I was the player that I was and, and really felt like I needed to get back to the U S. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And, and uh, Ian, thanks for the question. It, with that uh, 95 Giants season, even though it wasn't a full season, you played um, with Hideki Matsui when he was just a young one. What was your impression of him and what in that short time with him? Uh, he, he was a wonderful player. Um, they had a lot of players on that team. And of course, uh, the manager was uh, a famous manager, but it was really hard coming from, from the Swallows because you know that battle between Swallows and Giants and, and um, as well as the battle between the two managers. Um, uh, it, you know, so it was, it was tough to go over there. Um, but man, those were, those were some players that I'd played against that I really admired. So it was, it was a great time, but no, he was, he was a great player. You could tell he was going to be a star. Um, pretty quiet guy, um, but fun to be around. We had, we had a great team. We had a, a great group of guys. Um, I really probably in retrospect, um, you know, it's hard to look back and say, would you do things differently? But I definitely have thought back many times and wish I would have stuck it out that season and, and tried to finish and maybe get us into the playoffs. Yeah, well, um, I'd like to talk more about the managers, but there's a bunch of people with their hands raised. So I'm going to, we'll save that or maybe one of them will ask. Um, we're going to go to Saya Nomura. Hi, Shane. Sorry, I can't see myself. Um, there you go. Hi, yeah, Jack. You now. How are you? Good to see I'm you. Fine. Good to see you as well. Awesome. So I want to ask you what your experience was like playing under manager Katsuya Nomura and what were some things that you picked up or that you learned in Japan that you applied to when you returned to the States? Yeah, I've, I've said this many times when asked this question and I think he was a big key for me because um, my first manager with the Angels was Gene Mock and I really, really look at them as being, um, you know, an American and a Japanese version of the same type of manager. Just that that older manager that had so much insight, um, so much experience. Um, they weren't afraid to try different things, but you're talking about personality. The personalities was really huge for me because I grew up with Gene Mock where he was like a father figure to me. You know, it was kind of like, you know, you, when you weren't doing things well, you got that little mean look, you know, that tough look, that tough love, I call it. Um, but then, uh, nothing better than when you were doing things right. And he was appreciative, just that, that wonderful smile, you know, that you knew men of not many words. Um, it was more their, their facial expressions, uh, and you got, and so it was like that father figure, you know, so it was really key for me, um, because he was that same way and going over in Japan, I had a lot of pressure on me, but you know, he was tough on me in in the way that, uh, much like I said, like he, he, he was like Gene Mock, like in a father figure, but there was nothing. And I know you'll appreciate that this obviously with your relationship with him, but um, there's nothing better than after hitting a, you know, walk off home run or doing something special and, and just seeing that wonderful smile, you know, no words, just that nice smile when you come back. So um, no, it was a great experience. And, you know, he was a big reason for wanting to win too, because, uh, you know, I know he had, spent so much as time as a player um, and then a wonderful manager. And uh, I think that was a great gift to give to him. Thank you. 
You have that same smile. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was hoping someone asked about um, about playing for him. So thanks, Saya. You're right. You're right on cue. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so for those of you uh, who weren't on before when Saya was with us, she's doing some stuff on Twitter. It's really cool. So make sure you look up Saya on Twitter. She had Jack on um, earlier this year for some uh, cool discussions. So. Um, there's your plug. <laughs> um, Jack, with, uh, with Nomura, did you know he was, like, how long did it take you to figure out how big of a deal your manager was when you, when you first signed? Like, did, did people yeah, give you a heads up? <laughs> yeah, no, it's like three days in Yuma, you, you know, you first hear about what he was as a player. I mean, gosh, I'm, I'm probably going to overdo this, but I think he played till he was 40 or 45. I mean, he played forever. Um, so I knew right away I was dealing with a legend in Japan as a manager. Um, but no, I mean, nobody really talked to me. I don't want to portray it as if he was this mean guy. He was just, he expected, he expected the most from you. And that's what you want out of any leader or of any manager. You want them to, you know, not be content with sloppy play. I mean, uh, um, but then appreciate when, you know, good play. And that's kind of what I was alluding to is that, um, he was not easy to play for in that he had high expectations, man. Um, he wasn't just there to, well, obviously he played forever. So you knew that uh, uh, his commitment to the game and, and, and what he had brought to Japan baseball, and he expected that out of you and, uh, and wanted you to keep up that legacy and things. So, um, no, I did. It was, it was in Yuma, man. I heard all about his playing career and then definitely heard of his manager, but it was all positive. And that is just do your job, work hard. Um, don't disrespect him. And uh, and you'll have no problem, and and that was definitely, definitely the the way it was. Just uh, play hard, be on time, um, do the things that are expected of you, and um, there wasn't many rules compared to that. Uh, I think it was definitely a lot harder on the Japanese players. That's for sure. <laughs> um, um, I think he, uh, I think he really respected, uh, and I think he and maybe this was in the book, or, or maybe this is just something that I just knew about him. But you know, I think he really. He really wanted the Japanese players to be the best they could because obviously we're in Japan, but I think he understood that having one or two American players, I think he, he felt that that brought the level of the Japanese players up. And so that's why he wanted us Americans to play with that same type of Japanese spirit, but then go do our thing and, and be a compliment to those Japanese players. So I think he really appreciated um, the things that us American players brought to uh, his team and to the game. Got it. How, how would you compare uh, his style to Shigeo Nagashima's style with the Giants. Yeah, uh, you know, so you talk about obviously same players that, um, you know, that played forever and were, were legends there as players, um, but then a little different style, a little bit easier going um, uh, and, and, you know, not probably that stern father figure. Um, I think it was more that he expected you to look up to him for what he had done, um, but then he liked to, I don't want to say he didn't fool around, but I mean, uh, you know, probably a little bit more easygoing, just definitely a different type of, of personality. Um, but definitely uh, they had the respect for what they had done in the game in the past. Got it. Um, cool. Thanks for that. We have a couple more people with their hands raised. So I'm going to go to Ted. Hi, Jack. Um, I got a couple of questions. I, first of all, enjoyed your chapter in Robert Fitt's book about you and your son. I mean, I enjoy reading that. My question is, what do you do mentally when you're in a slump? And that's got to be the worst feeling, like that series where you struck out. But, you know, during the regular season in Japan or when you played for the Angels, what was it like, the feeling that you have mentally when you get in a slump and what do you do? I play senior softball. I'm not playing this year, obviously. But, you know, I get down on myself. And then I try to say, okay, I got to be more positive. What I'm going to do to improve to hit or even play, you know, besides getting in a hitting slump or making errors in the ball field? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's um, something that throughout my career I really had to delve in a lot. Um, and then now in my 17, 18 years in player development and pro baseball, um, it, it's really as a manager, 
Uh, Shane mentioned earlier, three years as a, as a minor league manager, it's not as much as the putting the lineup up and, and base coaching and, and the X's and O's. It's really more the mental part. I don't know how many times I have guys in my office and just really have to talk mental. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you're exactly right when you say think more positive. I mean, those are all in things, but it's hard when you're struggling, right. man, it's hard to say, well, I'm going to be okay. And, you know, it's okay, you know, forget about today and go to tomorrow. You have to find something to really focus on and really accomplish to get through that. And what I'm getting at is that I preach a lot about it's about the process and not results. Because what happens is when we're struggling, then I need to go get three hits today. Or if I could just get a big home run and we start thinking about the results. And the only thing that you can be in charge of is, and if, you know, if you're talking about hitting is, one thing that I can be in charge of is getting a good pitch and hitting it hard, you know, even getting a good right. pitch and even hitting it hard, you know, there's nine fielders out there. They make a diving play or, you know, they, you know, it just doesn't quite get over, over their, their glove. But if I can go back to those basic things of, I can at least this at bat focus on getting a good pitch and hitting it hard. Um, then I go back and then I start focusing on the process and then the results come. And sometimes we jump over the process and want to go to results. And the more we try to produce results, it's impossible. Let's face it. Right. It seems about failure seven out of 10 times. So, you know, to say that I'm going to go get three hits tonight so I can make up for the last week, um, it, it puts us in a rough spot. So I think that's, that's what I, what I try to work with guys on to get them out of that. I don't try to say, oh, man, take a deep breath. I mean, those are all important things. Those are part right. of the process. But, you know, and visualize and, 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 you know, you're a good player. I mean, those are all really good things. But what can I physically do? And the only thing you can physically do is get a good pitch and hit it hard. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure. Ted, do you get in some deep slumps in your softball team? <laughs> excuse excuse me do you get in some deep slumps on your softball team yeah, <laughs> yeah well you know we have like over uh 80 people that are, 500 people play in in the league and it's co-ed over 80 people are even over 80 years old playing wow wow it's great it really is well ted ted i don't know if this will make you feel any better but for years as a big league player I don't know how many church softball teams asked me to come play in playoffs. I don't know how many men's leagues asked me to come play because they're like, oh, man, we'll get a major leaguer and we'll win this thing. And right. I'm, I'm horrible when it comes to softball. So I can't wait long enough for that thing to come down, and I'm horrible. So my hat's off to you in softball because I'm, I'm not patient enough. <laughs> I've been playing it 15 years, and I play short field and shortstop. I love it. And I'm still running fast, Jack. There you still go, man. At 74 years old. Good job. <laughs> Keep it going. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dad. All right, Danny Hudson, I'm going to you. Hey, Danny. Hey, how you doing, Shane? Good, thanks. Welcome. Good. Um, Jack, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, so um, I just – I don't so much have a question. I just wanted um, – to share, I was in Japan um, just from 92 to 93, so that time you were there, and I was living up in um, Yamagata in the countryside, so um, I have to say before um, going to Japan, I, I hadn't heard of you. I'm Living in Colorado, I think that was right around the same time the Rockies came, so mm -hmm. I was more a Braves fan or a Cubs fan or any games I could get in Colorado, but... Um, the only games that I was able to watch on TV back then were the Tokyo Giants games. So I just remember um, whenever you guys would play against the Giants, I, I didn't know who you were, but I was just like, man, this guy tears it up every time I watch him. Who is it? Yeah. So um, I just, I kept remember seeing Howell on the back of your jersey and then just being like, just go, like, like I said, I was just like, I have never heard of this guy, but in Japan, this guy is legendary. So <laughs> I just thought I would um, share that with you. And um, I, I kind of became a Hanshin Tigers fan that year just because I was trying to be anti-Giants. So um, was Tom O'Malley their first baseman back then? Yes, he was. He had a wonderful career there. He was a wonderful player. And a lot of people don't know this, but we were playing them that 92 season. We were playing them. And I get two hits, I believe, the day before, which mathematically, 
I think Nomura-san told me mathematically if I get one more hit or whatever, then he was, and he took me out of the game. And who I was fighting against was Tom O'Malley for the batting title, and we were okay. playing against them. So once yeah. I got that hit, he took me out, and that was it. I win the batting title, and so it kind of went okay. down. That was a really cool season that year, yeah. fighting against Tom O'Malley for the batting title. Oh, cool. Yeah, so I think when um, – and I don't know if – I imagine you guys did the same thing. I saw, I saw the Tigers play – up in um, Yamagata, but I don't remember who they were playing. So I remember O'Malley playing first base then, and I kind of adopted him as my favorite player just because I was following the Tigers. But um, you definitely, you and him were the two guys that left an, a strong impression on me that year. So I just wanted well, to share. That. I appreciate it. I know it wasn't a question, but it was a wonderful comment in that it it, it leads me to say that it's important that we share that you know, that was a big turning point in my career because I had had eight years my, 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 uh, in the U.S. My talents were dwindling a little bit. I really didn't have a job. It was a really big turning point for me. And I was not really a very good off-speed hitter. I could hit a fastball with the best of them, but I struggled with off-speed. And I struggled against left-handers. And so what I'm getting at is that getting through that 92 season and then playing in Japan allowed me to be better at off-speed you know, kind of trick pitching um, allowed me to be much more patient. Um, and then really is for me, the reason why I was able to come back and play four more seasons. I wasn't a regular player. Once I came back, I was more of a bench player and utility player. Um, but I, you know, I ended up being a great pinch hitter um, um, through those four years and it got me four more years. So I think you saw me at a big turning point in my career, man. Uh, it could have went, it could have went south, you know, like in 92, I don't come back and, and do so well. I'm done and my career was probably over. So that was a big turning point that you saw in my career and in my life. Awesome. Were you playing mostly outfield then or first base? I played uh, with, in, I played Japan uh, in Japan. I was third base all the time. Oh, third base. Yeah. Yeah. Third base. Yeah. I was third base. Um, and most of my career in Japan, I was third base. Then when I came back for those four years, I was a pinch hitter, first baseman, and occasionally third base. I did play some outfield uh, in the Angels in the early years, but uh, mainly yeah. third. Now I recall you at third, yeah. And how, how tall and what was your weight either then, like when you were playing? Because I remember O'Malley being a big guy. You're, you were, were you built similar to him? Um, he was, you know, no disrespect to him, but I, I, part of my story is going back to the angels is that I was, I was a late mature. Uh, I matured really late. Um, Shane mentioned earlier, I was non-drafted. Um, but in those years I was really starting to lift weights. And then when I go to my rookie season in 86 with the angels, um, I met Brian Downing, who, you know, was the epitome of weight training and, and I really caught on to that. So to answer your question, I was a big, uh, lifter. So I was, I probably would, well, I mean, I'm not bragging, but I mean, I, I, we were probably about the same size around six he was foot. a little softer, I'm sure. Six foot 195. And, uh, yeah. and I want to say that I was definitely a pretty strong guy. So right. I was really into weight training. Still am. Cool. Great. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you, man. Appreciate the call. Yeah. You bet. Um, Greg Thompson, a resident encyclopedia points out that Tom O'Malley uh, replaced uh, was kind of your replacement of sorts with the Swallows in 95 um, and uh, helped t lead them to another title. So that is further a connection between you, you two there. Definitely. Um, and then another one from the chat, Rob Fitz, the uh, aforementioned author, says, um, <clears throat> Hi, Jack, it's nice to see you again. My question is, can you talk about Hiromito Ochiai? Could he have played in MLB and what was he like as a person? Yeah, definitely. I mean, a really quiet type, but uh, definitely a legend. Uh, when I got there, you know, a very well-respected player of what he had done in the past. And I think at that point, when I was playing against him, I think his talents were starting to dwindle a little bit, but he was still a big-time clutch player. Um, I think early on, earlier than those years that I saw him, he probably could have. I don't know how many more years he played after I was there. I'm not saying that he was old, but uh, I, I definitely think he could have been uh, a big league player, um, but he was definitely a clutch player and a very well-respected player. And he's one of those guys that when you come in, very quiet when you got to first base, you know, to talk to, um, but very respectful, very respectful guy. Um, but he was definitely a guy that we all looked up to. And, 
and you got you didn't want to when the game was on the line you definitely definitely didn't want him up there that's for sure cool thanks for that uh, i'm curious about um about jingu stadium so i really like that park um and it's set to be torn down soon i'm curious like uh about your favorite and least favorite things about that park it's a shame they're tearing it down that's that's sad to hear um I, I cannot honestly think of anything bad about it. Um, I love the ballpark. Obviously, it was a shorter porch, um, but a great park to play in. Um, man, that's uh, – yeah, there's some great memories there. Wonderful park. I'm sure, obviously, it's been a lot of years since I've been there, so I'm sure it's getting older and not one of the nicer parks now. But um, it was great for me uh, for those two years, Rex and I. Uh, when Rex was my teammate, we just lived down the street, so we'd ride our bikes down the hill from our apartment, and we'd come riding in the side with all the fans and ring in our little bells with our little um, bikes with our basket and sign autographs, and it was just a, it was great, man, a great experience. I loved the place. The fans were amazing, loud. Um, but uh, where are they going? Do you know? Are they going to build another they're, stadium? Are they moving somewhere? It's going to be in the same complex they're going to build it they're going to build one um so yeah i don't think there's really been any too much concrete plans but um it should be a quick transition and yeah they're going to build a new one right there so yeah I'm, i'll be sad to see it go but um hopefully they'll have something interesting at least to replace it definitely uh you mentioned rex uh rex huddler so can you talk a little bit about the community of the american ball players over there and how you helped each other and who some of the guys you were tight with uh, were? Yeah, I mean, the schedules were, were so much with so much practice and batting practice and obviously the travel and stuff that, you know, occasionally uh, you get to chat with the other Americans on the other teams, but for the most part, you had to get ready for the game. And, and so you couldn't do a lot. So it was really key was the, the, the other American players that you had with you. And, um, you know, I had some great players. I had uh, Johnny Ray, who I'd played with with the Angels a few years prior. Um, he was let go at the halfway point. Um, so, but it was that, you know, again, we talk about that 93 season. It's amazing that you talk about all the things that led to that type of season. But Rex Hudler having him as a teammate, um, just so, you know, always a big smile on his face, so up, uplifting. Um, and, you know, you think about, you talk about friends, you know, a friend is a friend that you can, a real true friend is a friend that you can tell your problems to and they don't necessarily try to make you feel better. They just kind of give you their advice as well as when you tell them the wonderful things that are happening in your life, you can truly hear them say, man, I'm so proud of you, man. And I'm so happy for you. You know, they're with you in the tough times they are with you in the, in the good times as well. And he was that type of player, you know, especially with the crowd that was around me and all the hype with being the MVP that year. Uh, he could have very easily been, you know, quote unquote jealous or, you know, uh, whatever the word is, but man, he, he played right into it. I don't know how many times he carried my bags to the bus when I was doing interviews. And a lot of times he would, you know, tease and say, you don't want my autograph. You don't want my, uh, my interview. You want that guy, you know, he was just, Oh my gosh, he made me feel like a King all the time, man. And, and he's still that way today. I mean, you call him on the phone and it's, you ask him two questions about himself and he asks you four about yourself. You know, it's just, he's just so, uh, so giving and caring. So yeah, he was a big part. He's a wonderful teammate. And kind of going back to your question is that I think that's really key, man. We need to lean on each other. It's hard. We have interpreters, um, you know, that help us, you know, communicate and things like that, but let's face it, it's Japan and, and, and the Japanese guys are, you know, or a community and stuff. And it's, it, there's a little bit of a, you know, obviously a language barrier there and it's hard to really connect. Um, but boy, to have that American guy that you can really uh, sit down and share things with and, and, um, and bounce things off. That that's a key, man, a real big key. That's great. That's, that's good to hear. I know. And uh, the, for any, if there's any Royals fans in the call, I know that they all love, love him there. Um, does a good job with their broadcast. Um, I'm curious a little bit about your, I want to talk a little bit about your coaching career and, uh, if you could just describe your approach as a, as a manager and, and obviously being undrafted, being a utility player, like how that plays in and also how your experience in Japan plays and if that has experienced your coach or influenced your coaching style at all. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a great question. I, I 
definitely feel the reason I've stuck at, you know, stuck around this long in player development is because of that extra intangible that maybe I give and not that, you know, not that drafted player, that, that non-drafted player that just found a way, you know, if you kind of think about uh, the, the course of my season, it's non-drafted and, and, and then in a year and a half, I make it to the big leagues and then, you know, eight big league seasons. And then all of a sudden I'm in Japan and then struggling Japan, but find a way to get through and then leave Japan and come back as a, uh, you know, in a tryout with the Angels and, 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 and made that team. And then even that after that year, they didn't give me a guaranteed deal. They just said, yeah, you can come back and, you know, go to spring training as a tryout. And I made it. And then I get the two-year deal with Houston. And so, you know, every year has been kind of one of those, just kind of just find a way to figure it out. You know, no guaranteed deals, just figure it out. And I think, you know, that's the thing that I can share with players and player development is that, you know, once you become a pro, whether you're a number one pick or a non-drafted player, it's time to get to work and figure this thing out. You got a short period of time to really put things together and get to the big leagues, which should be your ultimate goal. So I try to, I think, let them focus that it's not where you start, it's where you end up, you know, your ultimate goal and, and to kind of focus, you have to have something to aim for um, and to shoot for or else you'll just, you know, shoot at anything. So I try to get them to, to focus on their overall goal, but then really find out their why and, and, and why they're here and why they're playing. And then going back to what I think I said to, uh, was it Ted earlier that um, then really getting them focused on the process. Uh, there's been many guys that have hit 340 and never moved up. And there's guys that have hit 200 and moved up through the system. So, you know, we even as player development folks um, see more, uh, see deeper into just the stats all the time. It's, it's more the process and the way you play your the game and the, and the way you, your mental approach and are you a team player? There's a lot of intangibles um, that go to grading out a player as we move them up through the system. Um, and, and again, going back to the Ted, Ted talk is that, um, you know, we, that's why we tell them that if you focus on getting good pitches, if you focus on controlling the things you can control and understand the process and the things that we expect from you, the results will show up. You know, that's the way we, kind of do it as in player development is we, we realize those guys that um, that understand the process and can focus on it, um, that eventually as they move up in the system, the results will show up. Very cool. Very cool. Is there, is there a level, you know, you, you coach in the big leagues and various levels, is there a level you like the most? And I guess I could even include that with like amateur players or young players. Like what, what level do you like coaching? baseball players at the most? Yeah, I mean, another good question. I, I'm, you know, for a lot of years in player development, I was the field coordinator, which means I was the guy below the uh, farm director, which means um, really I'm overseeing all the player development as far as on the field and their advancement. And then more importantly, spending a lot of time working with our coordinators and our coaches and kind of just putting everything together, an overall game plan and philosophy. And um, it's, it's real important to you know, kind of understand your role um, and, and I'm kind of losing my train of thought. Give me your question again. I lost my train. Just your favorite Sorry. level of, to oh, work good. with. Oh, good. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, see, I'm 59 now, so I'm kind of, <laughs> I lose it every once in a while. Um, no, so, so being that overall leader was great, man. It's great to be in charge. It's great to, to lead um, coaches and help them to be the best they can be. But it's amazing that three years ago when I came down out of that position and became an eight ball manager, I realized really how much impact our managers really have because they're with them day to day. And so what I'm getting to is I, I love the spot I'm in now. It's that first full season. It's low A. Um, they've drafted. They've probably played in a rookie season. Um, you know, maybe spend a year or two in the rookie season. If they're in the Dominican or something, they've probably been at the academy a couple years now. They're only 19, 20 years old, maybe 21, maybe some 22-year-old college players. And now they're getting to go out and play in a league. You know, we're on buses, bus trips. We're playing under the lights. We're playing night games. It's a 130-game schedule. Um, it's their first chance to have a full season and really do something. And to me, at least for myself, that's where I think I have the most impact. I was a big league hitting coach, enjoyed that. I was a triple A hitting coach. I've been a hitting coordinator. Um, but boy, that, that grassroots level of them getting a chance to play a first full season um, to me is pivotal. There's a lot of players, as we know, whether they were drafted first or 101, um, 
don't make it out of that first A ball level. So I think it's huge. And then ultimately it's, you know, um, it's good to see. Uh, it was great to see Adele. I had him two years ago, Joe Adele, um, see him make it to the big leagues uh, this year and just kind of text him and say, I'm proud of you. And, and then they say, thank you. You know, um, it's, uh, that's really rewarding then to see him, uh, achieve their goals and make it to the big leagues. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, he's fun to watch. Um, so I guess this begs the question now. Leon is asking in in the chat to me. Uh, he wants to know your thoughts on, on – well, I guess he's not asking so much about the contraction, but bringing the minor leagues under the major league umbrella, talking about bringing it under the commissioner's office. But I guess we might as well just get your thoughts on the whole situation in general as well. Yeah, I mean, it would sound like I'm I'm eluding the question, but it's it's really in all honesty since uh, um, the minor leagues have been shut down and I've been furloughed with the Angels. I'm still an employee, but we're in a furlough basis. Um, our our poor field, uh, farm directors, you know, monthly and occasionally weekly tries to send us an update and there just isn't much right now. So I don't really know. I can tell you, you know, because I've known this for a year now that my team in Burlington was one of the teams you know one of the what was it 20 or 30 teams that they're they were considering cutting back so um do i think i'm going back to burlington at some point next year uh, i doubt that um but there really hasn't been a lot of information if you're asking just what i think of it obviously it's you know it's a shame i love burlington iowa it's the smallest market in all of baseball so i get that it's hard to draw fans because it's a small market but what a wonderful ballpark what wonderful heritage and and history they have there I love my office. I love the stadium. I love the fans. Um, and for that, I say that, you know, gosh, I, I just feel for, you know, those teams like that and those communities um, and, and that history that some of those teams are going to have that are going to be lost. But, you know, I understand that it's also a business. I understand that there's, you know, it's a contract year and they have things that uh, they want to change and put in place. And let's face it, this world is ever changing and sometimes we have to embrace and understand that. So am I excited about it? And am I sad for what could happen? Yes. Um, but then I'm also very optimistic into um, um, putting my faith in, in the major leagues and know that they will, uh, will hopefully come up with a, with a better system and we can get back to work and, and get back to what we love to do. And that is given our all to these players and giving them a chance to make it to the big leagues and achieve their goals. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, that's good perspective. Thanks. Um, all right. We, uh, John Cole has a question. John, I'm going to you. Hey, John. You're on mute. There you well, go. My, my question was just basically um, concerned uh, the uh, minor leagues also. So you just answered the question. <laughs> there you go. All right, where, we, where is he at? What was his shirt? Peoria Chiefs. Oh, yeah. Great ballpark. Wow. Yeah. yeah. In my travels, I've been to, I don't know, 589 baseball parks. Have you been to Burlington? You like Burlington? Burlington was a rain out. I saw the Burlington oh. play, but that, that was one of my few rain outs. Gotcha. Met, yeah, but I did uh, – I um, uh, the trip with the, the team in the Quad City, the River Bandits. Sure. And I saw um, uh, Beloit, the Snappers. Mm -hmm. And I went to Burlington, but it got rained out. So it was, it, I, it, I, I was disappointed, but I'll get back if they, if they start, a, if they start a team. Yeah, I hear you, man. Well, I appreciate. It. We love all the fans. That Peoria is a great place, and uh, I love the Midwest League. And let's just hope they realign it and make it all work, man. I would love to go back there and manage. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a retired firefighter in, from Baltimore, Maryland. So yes, it was, it was great going out there, though. Awesome, man. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. John, John and uh, the teams that are set to be contracted tentatively, are, are any of those ones that um, – how many of those were you, have you not been to that's going to well, mess with your account? Um, um, I'm not sure because I haven't looked at the updated list, but uh, um, a lot of them are the rookie leagues and then the A-ball team. So, and I've been to – I don't know how many I got left, but I'd have to look at my list and figure it out. Got it. Okay. Well, I hope that you're able to get to all of them. Yep. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> all right. I am going to go to 
Are you bringing, getting something to show us, John? No. Okay. All right, Duff, I'm going to you. Hey, Duff. Hey, welcome aboard. Uh, speaking since we're on a uh, Midwest League bent, uh, what do you think of um, Quancy River Bandit, Steve, with the Ferris wheel and, uh, and uh, all, all the accoutrements there? No, I, I love it, man. It's a, they do a great job. Great fans. Uh, definitely when the lights go down and you see the lights on the bridge and the, and like you said, the Ferris wheel, I mean, it, it is a great atmosphere. Um, I will tell you though, they've been pretty tough on us the last couple of years. So it's a tough place to go because we were normally getting our, our butts kicked, but I believe it was my first year. I think it was my first year. Um, they won it all. They won the first half on us. Um, and so that was, you know, and the place went nuts and all that. So that was a tough place to play. Um, the only complaint I will say is they need to get their alarm system fixed because twice, for whatever reason, when we were there, the fire alarm goes off and they had to exit the stadium. And here we are in uniforms out in the parking lot. I don't know if you were ever there when that happened, but oddly enough, that happened twice while we were playing there in the last two years. So they definitely need to get that system fixed. Yeah, <laughs> especially on a weekend to be on the third base side and have the river and the Centennial Bridge as a background. They used to have the gambling boats used to go up and down the river. And uh, they, they were, you know, of course, the paddle wheelers. And they would play the calliopes once they got under the Centennial Bridge heading, you know, back toward the, where, where they were docked. But it's just a great experience. Yeah, well, wonderful. Once the lights go down, man, I mean, once the sun goes down and those lights light up, man, it's a it's an incredible atmosphere, no doubt. Great ballpark. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you, man. That sounds fun. I'll have to check that one out. Uh, Richard Guywitz, I'm going to you next. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hey, Richard. Um, I have a, uh, Jack, I have a MLB question for you since you're in player development. Um, it, it seems like the bottom third in Major League Baseball always struggles. I'm here in Baltimore, you have Kansas City. You know, you get lucky if you get four or five good players, you have a playoff run, two years later, they're all gone. Is this going to be a permanent thing, do you think, in MLB? that the bottom third's just always going to be like a, a tier two, um, you know, quality franchise? Um, so I think if we could ever come up with the question of how to bring some of those lower clubs out, you know, what is that key formula? I think we'd be millionaires, that's for sure. I've been with, uh, you know, the D-backs for 10 years, uh, was with the Mariners uh, for four and now back with the Angels for five years. So I've been in organizations and been sat in a lot of offices with, you know, general managers and ownership and stuff and really trying to figure out those questions of how do we make changes, whether that be through minor leagues, through our draft system, you know, uh, where do we spend our money? Do we get more into analytics? I mean, so many questions go into how can we in a year or two change things around and get back into the playoffs and get better. And it's a tough, tough balance and a tough question. Um, my opinion is, and I don't have any proof on this, but, you know, and, and I don't want to say that I like that there is contraction uh, because I definitely don't like the way they're getting rid of some clubs. But the part that I did hear about that is that um, they are talking about, you know, slim, uh, how do you say it, you know, getting to where like minor league teams from East Coast teams are more on the East Coast, you know, so, so cleaning up the travel a little bit. Um, which I think, you know, and making it a little more economical and a little bit easier travel for minor league players, I think that's going to have a big impact. I think obviously, you know, conserving money and being a little more frugal so we can put our money to things that really count, I think that's going to be key. But the point that I'm leading to from what I think I'm getting from it is there's a chance that it would be mandatory that each um, big league team only have six minor leagues. And so to me, that should seem like it would, it would clean up the playing field a little bit, you know, um, because you think about with the Angels, I think we have six. When I was with Seattle, we had seven. But I hear the, the uh, Yankees have nine or ten clubs, you know, and let's face it, you know, the more talent you have, you got nine clubs. That means you have that many more players. The more players you have, the better chance you're going to have of a few players making it to the big leagues and having an impact. So maybe it's going to level the playing field a little bit. Um, putting some more restrictions on clubs um, to where, you know, from what I've heard, it's, 
it will be your, you know, triple A, double A, um, two A balls. That's four, you know, a, some type of a Latin club, and then a team down at your uh, spring training facility, a rookie club, and that's all you can have. So maybe that'll level it up a little bit, and and maybe what you'll see is is teams can then feel like they're on more of a level playing field, and maybe you'll see, you know, those each year you'll see teams fluctuating and bouncing around uh, and maybe being more competitive. That would be my, that's an educated guess. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's an interesting perspective. Um, and Michael Westway points out that's why the giants and the Hawks are so strong in Japan. They have more minor league teams. There you go. Than anyone else. Um, so we have a couple people from Tucson on Karen. I know sent, send some respect. She's from Tucson and James McKnight has a question. He's also in Tucson and, you want to say awesome. hi? Awesome. Hi, Jack. Yeah, I enjoyed watching you back in the 90s. Um, my dad actually was a teacher at Palo Verde when you were there, if you can believe that. Um, awesome. <laughs> Did, if, you ever took, if you ever took a melody with Mr. McKnight. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. I have, that's your dad? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I was not very good at it, but he passed me anyway. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, all right. I'll, I, I told him about you a long time ago, but uh, so many students went by. But um, glad to see you doing well. I, I'm a Hunting Tigers fan. I was just curious, any uh, road games that were particularly hard for you when you were on Yakult? Were the Tigers fans intimidating or were uh, Tokyo Giants fans more intimidating? Just, just curious. Yeah, no, you hit it right. I mean, Anqing was a tough place to play. Um, obviously, that big stadium was packed and filled, and they were, they were, they were tough. Plus, I mean, the Tigers. When we played the Tigers, they were tough. That was a tough ballpark to go to. Um, trying to think here, tough places. I really enjoyed the country towns. That was different. They weren't the greatest ballparks, but man, the fans were. They seemed like they came out of the woodwork. And that was really cool to just all of a sudden pop over these hills, you know, driving through these trees on a little bus coming from the train. And you're like, where in the heck are we going? And you pop over and here's this massive stadium and just thousands of people around the stadium. And so that was pretty cool. Um, trying to think of a tough ballpark. Um, I don't think they were that tough. I mean, definitely you hit on the Tigers was uh, – that was not – I'll tell you what, Hiroshima was not easy too, man, because it was a smaller park and the fans were right on you. Um and they were a pretty good club too. I based it more really on on the teams we were playing, and the Tigers were always tough. That was always a big battle. Yeah, there was always the big battle in the Tokyo Dome, and you know we we talked earlier about the two managers, the battle that they had against each other, and that was kind of a rivalry. But definitely, um... yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. I I, I love I lived in Japan twelve years, so I I like going to Jingu. That was my closest stadium, but. Uh... Tiger's my number one, yeah, Colt my number two, so thanks. Hey, I hate, I hate to ask you this, but is your dad still alive? Yeah, yeah, he's 84, yeah. So awesome, he's man. Up. Is he so, in Tucson? Yeah, he's side, yeah, we live only like three miles from Palo Verde. You're still there. My mom My mom is still in the same house that I that I was born in also. Crazy. <laughs> uh, that's crazy. Well, hang in yeah. there. Tell him I said hello. Oh, well, nice talking with you. Thanks. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thanks, James. All right, Toshiki, I'm going to you. Thanks for waiting. Oh, all good. Hi, hi, Jack. Uh, it's truly an honor to talk to you. Uh, you're a legend. Thank you. So, <laughs> thank, you, man. Um, thank you. Yeah, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, what were some of the toughest adjustments you had to make when you went to Japan, uh, cult culture and baseball wise, both? And uh, next one is, what was your reaction when you first saw the umbrellas going up and down at Jingu Stadium? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, definitely I think the big thing I hit on a little bit earlier was just uh, getting away from family. That was really tough, right. being split up from family. Um, and then, you know, kind of my personality. I, I'm an introverted guy, but definitely was always a team player and, and really um, enjoyed getting to know the players. So that was really tough early, you know, that connection. It's hard to interpret, you know, through an interpreter was really hard. There just wasn't that connection, you know. You didn't have that closeness. Um, but Ikiyama and Hirasawa were, and, and, and uh, you know, were, were great teammates that really wanted to try to, you know, speak English and, and really try to get to know each other. So, I mean, that was really, really tough, was just not really having that team unity. It was just so hard and speaking through an interpreter. 
you kind of find ways to get through that, but that was really tough. Um, but then again, obviously being away from family, um, but I enjoyed my time in Japan. I, I, I love the culture there. Um, I love rice. I, I was brought up on rice and stuff. So, um, and I, I'm a real picky eater. It's amazing. I don't eat fish. So the fish threw me off a little bit, but, um, I always grew up on fried rice and things. So I found a nice little place down by our apartment. Um, where they would make me a special beef fried rice. They'd put some beef in there and some veggies and, and fry up the rice, and I would go there all the time. Um, so I really handled the food well. Of course, Kobe beef. I love steak being from Arizona. Um, um, so the food wasn't a problem. I just didn't eat the fish. Um, and then, sorry, what was your other question? Oh, um, the umbrellas. Yeah, umbrellas. The umbrellas, yeah. No, and I think that was the most – that was the amazing thing. Not that, not that the fans in America – um, aren't that way. I'm not trying to diss that, but you know, you think about, and maybe it's changed a little bit now, but you think about going to a game in the U S you know, it's more of a, it's more of a kind of going as a group and you sit around and talk or there's businesses that have suites and they're bringing in clients and it's more of a gathering and Oh, by the way, there's the game, but you know, or it's a social event. And so I think that was the cool thing that really brought me back to what I remember growing up as the roots of baseball. And that is just, you know, fans cheering. And, you know, I think about in the olden days, my dad used to always sit down and keep score, you know, and he'd always have a glove, you know, like ready to catch a ball and just that type of experience. And that's what Japan remind me of just, you know, the umbrellas, but you know, more than the umbrellas was the thing that's amazing. I can almost still sing it now was that every player had their own fight song, (laughs) you know? And I mean, just amazing that every player comes up and everyone knows the fight song and they're singing his own private fight song. I mean, that's just incredible stuff. So yeah, the fans were, the fans were wonderful, man. It was great. And you know, probably the other thing, I'm not going to say they don't boo, but it was, it was nice that on either team, regardless if there was good play, there was always cheering really wasn't a lot of booing. They just enjoyed good baseball, man. And it was, that was very refreshing for me. Cool. Thanks so much. All right, man. Yeah, I think we all, a lot of people here have, have been to Japan to watch games, and I think we all agree with, with that take. It's really a, an awesome experience, especially for the purists. So, yeah, totally no agree. Um, all right, so everyone, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. Danny Hudson, I'm going to go to you here in a second. But uh, um, Jack's got to take his mom to dinner, so we can't take him, <laughs> keep him so long. So if you have a question, raise your hand now. It's the last chance. All right, Danny, going to you. Okay. Hey, Jack, again. Sorry, I'll try to keep it quick. Um, I was just curious that year I was in Japan, I always thought it'd be like a a cool job. And I thought it, I just wanted to get your take. Do you think having an American, um, maybe that was working for a Japanese club, but helped the American players that went to Japan kind of be a liaison between American players and the Japanese club? I always thought like, for me personally, and probably a lot of us on this call, like that would be a position that we'd all, or that was just something that came to me. And I don't know if those positions exist. And one, my Japanese was terrible at the time. And two, I was far away from Tokyo. So it wasn't going to happen. But in my mind, I, I kind of always saw myself like that would be an ideal job for me. And I just want to get your take if you think there would be like a, a need for that kind of position, I guess from an American perspective rather than a Japanese interpreter. Yeah, so it's, a, it's amazing that you asked that because um, once I came back from Japan and then ended up pl- uh, finished playing and was in um, pro baseball and player development started in 2002. Um, in 2003, I got a call from my interpreter um, and the Swallows um, that asked me about a couple players and I gave them some players. I ended up those first three years helping them sign um, three of our players that went there. Um, and I would do that through the interpreter. And it's amazing that, you know, I would always do exactly what you're talking about, but not do it, say, as being paid or being an employee of the Swallows. I did it because once they signed, they would call and say, Jack, thank you so much. They offered me a contract. I'm going to Japan. Here's what happened. And I would end up sharing my advice, man. Go there, um, you know, humble yourself you know, do what you're told early. And then as things go, then you can kind of set your own ways. And I give him tons of advice like that. And yeah. then, and then about halfway through my career, uh, coaching career, I talked to a few guys and, and asked those same questions. Like I was really trying to get back to Japan in whatever capacity. And it was just, it never really kind of panned out, but it was almost like what you were talking about is just to kind of be there. 
I think maybe had I been better in, in Japanese, you know, maybe had I learned Japanese, maybe that would have been better so that I could communicate both ways. But yeah. what I'm leading to is, um, I believe I was on a Zoom call not too long ago, maybe when the when the uh, COVID thing hit. And I'm pretty sure Tom, Tom O'Malley does that now. I think he works with a club. His job is to help go scout some players. And then I think when he signs them, I think he does a really good job of helping them, um, you know, uh, migrate into now what it is to be a Japanese player. So I think, I think they're doing exactly what you're thinking about and you hit on a great point. I, I wish I could have done that. I, I mean, I'd still do it today if that opportunity was there, but I think just like what you're saying, just share those insights and kind of help them get through that transition. It's not easy. Um, yeah. We've had some Japanese players come to our American teams uh, over the years and, and I always kind of, you know, endear myself to them a little bit because, and I've told our players that a lot of times that, you know, coming back from, coming from Japan and coming over here, it's not easy, man. And I talk about that with our Venezuelan players too, man. They're in a whole different country, a whole different lifestyle. And it is not easy, man. That's it's, it's tough being away from home and being in another country. So yeah, who knows? Okay. Maybe, uh, maybe someday I'll get to go do that. Maybe that'll be towards the end of my career or something. Well, call me up and I'll help you. Oh, appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah man. You. Sounds like a dream job. All right, Ian. Ian has another question too. Then we'll then we'll wrap it up. Ian, you alluded to this earlier about the differences between Japanese and American spring training and training. So, were you with any American? Do you ever talk to any American players that just absolutely hated it and refused to do it? Like I remember reading about Reggie Smith and like Warren Cromartie, how like and other players who are just shocked by it and just thought I'll refuse and others who embraced it. So like, yeah, I don't have, I don't have the, I don't have the history or the stats on this, but I would venture to say that a large percentage of the ones that couldn't stand it and hated it and thought it was useless. They didn't last very long, you know, and that's the way I kind of look at it is that, yes, it was, it was longer showing up in February, you know, in Yuma, Arizona, to start spring training, you knowing the season would start in April, that's a tough pill to swallow. But you know what? You do it. It's 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 what they expect, and you just go do it. And um, it's just it's just a different culture. It's just the way it was. But you're right. Some of the stories of the guys that didn't laugh a half a season, or maybe made it through one season and then either bolted or got kicked out of there, um, always kind of tell that type of story. Like, oh, the practices were too long, or they were too tough, or it was a different style. You know, they just complained about it instead of understanding that. It's Japanese baseball. I mean, it's another country. It's another lifestyle. It's just, you know, you should have thought about that before you went there, you know. And it's not that I knew all those insights before I went there, but I'm also smart enough to know that, you know, you're not going to have all the different things that you're used and customs and things that you're used to in the U.S. It's going to be different. You have to adapt. And I think if you think about that in life, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but I think it's that way you could apply that to anything in life, you know, a new job. Um, taking on a new family, having kids. I mean, those are adjustments and changes you better be able to embrace and, and adapt and, and, and adapt to. And I think the answer to what I'm saying to you is, is I think a large percent of those guys that just said, oh, that's ridiculous, or they, uh, they thought it, was, that was, it wasn't worth the effort, uh, they didn't last very long, in my opinion. Uh, sorry for it. Thank you so much for answering. It's great to talk to the MVP. Will you be at uh, Angel Spring Train next year? I hope so, man. We're all uh, we're all kind of on pins and needles once and wondering what uh, 2021 is going to look like. We've not been given a lot of information just for the fact that I don't think I think they're trying to get through this this, uh, you know, shortened season in the big leagues and then hope that COVID gets over. And then October, end of October is when all contracts come up. So I should know more the end of October. But um, I'm a pretty positive guy and I think I add some value to the Angels and what I do and with my experience and I'm expecting that I'll be asked back and what capacity I don't know. And will spring training be in February and March like normal? Who knows, man, I sure hope so. Let's hope that after the new year, uh, we get through this election and then get through the new year. Let's hope things get back to quote unquote normal in January and, and 2021 is, is another baseball season and we're all happily working, doing what we do. That's, that's my goal and my hope. Well, if, if fans are able to go and if you're back, I'll definitely love to say hello and get your autograph. Well, I appreciate it, man. Definitely reach out. Appreciate that.
Thank you so much. All right, man. Yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I think we're all with you with that hope um, of having somewhat of a normal season next year. Um, before we say bye, um, do you, Jack, I just want to give you the opportunity if you'd like to, to talk a little bit about what you're doing off the field and let people know where they can find you as well if they're interested in following up. Sure, I appreciate that. Um, let's see, where do I start? Well, I'm back in Tucson and um, really taking care of my mom. You mentioned that earlier. She's going to be 90 on Monday, so my brother's coming in and we're going to have a nice 90th party for her. Um, and so really been, it's been a blessing coming back to really help her through this COVID and, and help her get back to better, better health. Um, I do have a son here and a brother, so I got family. Obviously, my grandkids are back in Kansas, so I try to go back there occasionally to check on them. Um, but from a personal standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm still, uh, you know, employed by the Angels, but uh, in furloughed, so I can't really work. Um, but uh, I have been able to, and, you know, you guys will get a kick out of this. I've been able to uh, give a few hitting lessons to some friends. And I think back of, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago, or even as a player, most of the time when I would give a hitting lesson or spend some time um, doing things with, uh, with players, uh, it was my friend's. Um, sons, right? So now I talk about being 59. It's amazing. The kids I'm working with are my friend's grandkids. <laughs> so, so that's taken on a different perspective. But no, occasionally, uh, like I said, I know enough people here where I've been able to go give some lessons. I'm not making money on it, but I'm just doing it to stay in the game and share my knowledge and, and get out and do stuff. One thing that I have done that I've really enjoyed, I alluded earlier that I've always been in weight training. I still keep myself in pretty good shape and love training is my old friend from, I mean, we've been friends for 35, 40 years, lives uh, just about two miles from me and he's my same age. And so when I came back to town, he said, man, um, I got to get back in shape. So I literally for two months now, I've been going Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from seven to eight in the morning. I train his wife in their home gym. And then I train him from eight to nine and then I get to lift from nine to 10. And it has been a great experience because I've, you know, I'm not a certified trainer, but I've done it enough. And it's just great to see them getting back in shape, being able to move around, do the things they want to do. They're starting to lose weight now. They're starting to eat better. And it's been, it's been a real blessing. So I think we, you know, in this COVID time, we've got to find the positives and it's allowed me to do some things that I probably would have never have done before, kind of take a step back and take care of my mom and really, uh, you know, kind of enjoy life and, um, but definitely missing baseball, but how they can reach me. I do a podcast on Wednesday at four o'clock, uh, mountain standard time called control the zone. That's on blog talk radio forward slash Mancini sports. Um, and I try to have guests on and just try to come up with insights of ways that we can gain some control of, of whatever, uh, zone in our life that appears out of control. So it's only 30 minutes. So it goes quick. Um, I have a website that I've been messing around with for a couple of years has a lot about me. And then I have a control the zone video series on there. And then I do archive my podcast on there. So you can see some past podcasts. Um, and that's, um, www.jrhowl.me. Um, yep. I'm going to put that in the, in the chat for everyone. Okay. And if they would go on there, I'm not on there selling anything, but there is a place where they can register. And all it does is give me your email so that when I add anything to the site, it just sends you a little uh, update just saying that Jack updated some things on his site. That's it. It's not going to send you a bunch of mail outs and things like that. And then um, over the years, I've been, I kind of want to mention this. I've been with a wonderful man out of, out of New York that I met uh, uh, four or five years ago, and I've kind of been helping him design a robotic batting tee. Um, wow. And we're, we're about ready to go to funding. So if there's anyone on this site here that would like to send us a million dollars, uh, just <laughs> uh, grab my email. But no, we're looking for some funding now. But I think it'd really be cool. It's just a, about a $250 robotic batting tee. We have a couple other patents. Um, and so I'm looking forward to kind of hoping that 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 takes off and that I can uh, lend some more insight. I would be more helping him with the training portion of it, not necessarily the selling or anything, but it would be more uh, the training and just not to bore you, but so you understand what would you mean? Robotic batting team. We've heard many people say, why don't I just buy a $75 Tanner tee and move it up and down? And the question is, cause you won't. 
And the point about moving up and down is we're finding out the way the brain works is randomization. You know, instead of hitting a ball in the same spot at the same time, doesn't really, there is no muscle memory, so it really doesn't help uh, facilitate in a swing. Uh, we know pitchers are trying to throw it all over the zone, so when we're working, we need to have that ball randomly moving. And so um, that first tee would just move up and down on one axis. We do have a patent for another tee that would move up and down and in and out. And it's battery operated and just a, a better way and a smarter way for guys to train. So those are kind of the things that I'm doing um, and uh, looking forward to, to baseball coming back. Yeah. Wow, cool. Thanks for sharing that. And I, so I put the um, links in the chat for everyone. And then Jack, when you get um, – with the T, that sounds really interesting. I'd be happy to help promote that or put that out on our social media and whatnot. Hey, so just thank you. Me know. Yeah, that'd be great, man. Appreciate um, it. Yeah, but thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'll let you. I'll give you the green light to go uh, help take care of your mom. Um, but I really appreciate hearing from from your wisdom and your experience. There's some really cool takeaways there, and um, I knew you'd have some interesting things. But uh, yeah, you really surpassed expectations, and I think I speak for everyone when I say that. And yeah, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Uh, I've been on a lot of Zoom in the last two, three months, and I love the way you set it up, and you do a great job, and uh, it was a pleasure. So thank you. Keep up the good work. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, so take care. Um, go ahead. You hey, can man. sign off if you want. Everyone else, you stick around. We'll, we'll talk to Michael for an NPB update and whatnot. But uh, have a good night, Jack. Thank you. Jack.